Good morning. My name is Joyce Tischler, and I'm one of your newest members. I've lived most of my life in Northern California, and in December of 2018, my daughter and I moved from Petaluma, California, a town of 50,000 in Sonoma County, to Portland. And I came here for a job that was too good to pass up. I teach as part of the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law School. You've probably never heard of animal law, but that's what I've done most of my life. But leaving Petaluma meant that I left a lot behind. I left behind my house, the house that I had raised my daughter in, the house that my husband and I had bought in 1994, the house that he had died in in 2003. I left some of my family back there. I left the job that I had had for 40 years. And most painfully, I left my UU church in Petaluma. That was my support system. It was my spiritual center, and it's where most of my friends were. Leaving all of that behind was a lot harder than I realized it was going to be. In fact, it was wrenching. I had to start over at the age of 60-whatever, and I was lonely. I visited pretty much every UU congregation in the greater Portland area, and there are a lot of them. But I was like Goldilocks. This one was to that, that one was to that. None of them seemed quite right because they weren't the UU church that I had left behind. And then COVID hit, right? That's everybody's story. And then COVID hit. And I was about to give up, but I had a phone call with Reverend Marsha and that changed my perspective. The funny thing about that phone call was that I was calling her to tell her why I was not going to join UUCWF. Yeah, I'm a shy little creature. Um, but by the end of the conversation, I realized that UUCWF was the right congregation for me. I could see that Reverend Marsha is compassionate and patient and very wise. She helped me realize that what I thought I didn't like about this congregation was simply that it wasn't the congregation I had left behind in Petaluma with all my friends, and that no other church service was going to be the same during COVID. Duh. She convinced me to give it another try, even though she didn't realize by the end of that phone call. <laughs> and then a few months later, she invited me to serve on the stewardship committee. Oldest trick in the book, right? give the wanderer a job to do and a reason to stick around. So now, um, this morning and every Sunday morning, I'm attending Forum, which is a marvelous group of quirky people. <laughs> and I'm now working with the Stewardship Committee, which is another marvelous group of people. And I feel like I'm becoming part of this community. And that makes all the difference in the world to me. Even with the pandemic, even though most of us are still on Zoom, you are making me feel welcome, and for that I am truly grateful. I hope that in the not too distant future, I'm gonna meet more of you and that I will earn your friendships. UUCWF is becoming my home, and because of that, I want to help keep it strong and vibrant and growing. And to do that, I pledge to give my time, my ideas, both the good ones and the not so good ones, and my financial support, because that's something that UUCWF needs from me and from all of us. You are giving me a lot, and each of us gets so much back from this church. And I hope you'll join me in giving what UUCWF needs to remain a welcoming community for the future wanderers who, like me, will come here in need of a beloved community. Thank you for listening. Good morning. <laughs> Could you use a couple more friends, maybe even a lot more friends? Would meeting and getting to know people who are quite different from you be scary, interesting, rewarding? By bringing your attention to the importance of friendships and the possibility that you can cultivate them, 
you may find, as I am finding, that your life is enriched as your circle widens. Kate Fassett and I are working on a podcast together called The Friendship Project. It was something that Kate approached me about a few months ago. Since then, Kate uh, and I have been learning how to use a microphone, <laughs> how to use software for podcasts, etc. We've also practiced with Kate's dad and two of Kate's friends. Just to get some experience before we tackle a real subject for an interview, we want to get our skills down. One of the many interesting aspects of our project is discussing what constitutes friendship. How friends change over time, who were role models, how do other people do friendship? Why people have behaved the way they do to make, keep, or lose friends? A lot of what goes into friendships, frankly, is a mystery. There's the influence of our parents, our childhood, culture, role models on TV, books, in social media. All of these and more affect us, and that's not even looking at our biases, anxieties, desires to fit in or turn away. It all adds up to an array of awesome, awkward, disappointing, and mystifying relationships called friends. But several themes have stood out already in our interviews that I would like to share with you. As you might expect, COVID is a big one, along with social distancing, communication like texting or Zoom, which present their own difficulties. But there is another less obvious thread that ran through them, an openness to cultivating friends and embracing change. What I mean is seen in the first woman we spoke with, I'll call her Jane since I don't have her permission to talk about her. Jane has spent decades filling up a Rolodex full of people from almost every continent. She makes sure to reach out to them and she reaches out to them in ways that they prefer. Some, for example, don't like Zoom. Some prefer phone calls, others emails. Jane will accommodate them. When not in COVID lockdown, she travels four times a year all over the world to visit her friends. People who don't look like her or live like her, but they share a deep friendship that Jane makes sure to grow and maintain. The other woman I will call Jackie, who told us she grew up learning very impractical and unrealistic ideas about friendship, she didn't, she, which she didn't realize until just after college. Since then, she has purposefully worked on knowing uh, herself better to be authentic with her friends because she cares about the quality of her relationships and she wants to stop reenacting her old patterns that keep her isolated. For example, she got sober, she tells people up front she doesn't drink, but that their drinking doesn't bother her. She also tells people up front she has ADHD, all in the interest of cultivating friendships that will last more than just a few years. She wants people to know her, and she wants to know and understand them. She's willing to change to have new friends, ones that don't have to be like her old drinking buddies or friends from high school. Cultivating friendships can mean giving up old habits, interacting with people who are very different from you and have different, different preferences in how they communicate and socialize. By bringing your attention to the importance of making friends from other circles, you may find, as I am, that your life is enriched as your circle widens. How do you tell a really diverse Unitarian Universalist congregation? There are lots of different colors of Priuses in the parking lot. I promise th there's a reason for that. When you ask someone what they love the most about their small or mid-sized Unitarian Universalist congregation, oftentimes you get answers like, church is my family or we're all one big family here, or lots of variations on, I love being around like-minded people. There is a lot of truth in many of those sentiments. My favorite seminary professor, Reverend David Bumba said that because Unitarian Universalists don't have a creed, we tend to be more homogenous in a lot of ways, hence the Prius joke. Studies have shown that Unitarian Universalists tend to be more alike than many other denominations. 
And there certainly is something comforting about being surrounded with like-minded people, especially when one lives in a conservative area. The local UU church can be a great place to find your people. But my friends, the drawback to this way of looking at our congregations is twofold. First, it's not true, or it's not as true as we think it is. Like Stephanie said last week, 14% of folks in Unitarian Universalist congregations identify as libertarians or Republicans. Our insistence that everyone thinks exactly the same leaves some people out wondering if they really belong. Now, I do want to acknowledge that we have some important religious values that tend to fall more on the liberal end of the spectrum. Our belief in the inherent worth and dignity of every person calls us to welcome LGBTQ folks into our congregations and into full rights of personhood. It calls us to treat immigrants with dignity and respect, no matter their legal status. We can have different ideas on the finer points of immigration law, but we can agree that taking children from their parents at the border is wrong. It calls us to rise up for black lives. And we can certainly agree that contrary to current Texas policies, health care for trans kids is health care and not child abuse. But the biggest problem with assuming everyone in our congregations is just like us is that it can make us undesirable to folks who would love to be in a UU congregation, but experience us as unwelcoming. Paula Cole Jones, a black Unitarian Universalist who is a longtime racial justice leader in our movement, gave a presentation in January to local congregations called Building a Culture of Inclusion. In this presentation that was done for several congregations on Zoom, she spoke about creating a congregation that instead of seeing itself as a family, which tends to be full of insiders, hard to break into, and run in a fairly hierarchical manner, that we see our congregations as communities of communities. Our congregations really are a community of communities, different groups that overlap to make a full congregation. Certainly the groups overlap, just like communities do. In our congregation, we have the forum and we have the choir, religious education, men's group, women's book group, the folks who work at the Hope Food Pantry, the board of trustees, the worship associates, and so many others. We have communities based on shared interests and communities based on shared service. We don't expect the RE families to have the exact same interests as the folks in the forum but we all work together to support this congregation. When someone has had a baby or been in the hospital or needs meals for whatever reason, it tends to work best if we ask the members of our community who are in a smaller community with that person. Some folks are willing to help anyone from the church. Thank you, Kate Fassett. But people are often more willing to help someone they know and these smaller communities are the way that most of us get to know people. If we see ourselves as part of a community within a larger community, then we don't think everyone needs to think or be just like us. We can find folks we have things in common with and know that we are just one part of a larger community. The other thing that Paula Cole Jones talked about was the eighth principle. Many of you may know about the proposed eighth principle of Unitarian Universalism. I preached on it a couple of weeks ago. Journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse and multicultural beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. The workshop will be rebroadcast on Saturday, March 26th and I encourage you to take the time to view it. Information will come out about it. Many of us want more diverse communities. We want more racial diversity within our congregations, but few of us know how to get there. 
The title for this sermon, Widening the Circle, comes from a report from the most recent UUA, or Unitarian Universalist Association, Commission on Institutional Change, called Widening the Circle of Concern. This report, which came out in 2020, is the report of the Commission's work on racial justice and sometimes racial tensions within the UUA. They gathered testimony from many Unitarian Universalists and specifically sought out testimony from UUs and UU religious professionals of color. The Commission had many suggestions, but several of them boiled down to this. The culture of many congregations is not keeping pace with the expectations of new generations for anti-oppression practices. Specifically, it says that sometimes our congregations often have the characteristics of elite social clubs rather than that of religious institutions. As a religious institution, we are bound in covenant to a set of beliefs and aspirations. Our inclusive, pluralistic principles allow individuals to find their own paths to truth within our UU frame. Yet often individuals don't see that our faith community is held together by a set of common communal values. When individualism is not in balance with communal good, individualism can become toxic to our religious community. The report then includes a testimony which describes a situation where a congregation was doing visioning work with the dot theory, which is that anyone can offer an idea. You usually write down ideas on post-it notes and put them up on a wall, and then everyone gets a couple of dots, and you put your dots where you want to vote for. You know, I'm, I am most interested in this. I think this is a great goal. This is something that I, I want to do. An anonymous person wrote, so one of the things that I wrote in the process was that I would like the congregation to commit itself to anti-racism. And a lot of people wrote that they wanted to see the congregation become more diverse. And there were a lot of blue dots next to becoming more diverse. But there were no blue dots next to becoming anti-racist. How are we going to come, become more diverse unless we commit ourselves to acting against racism? It's easier for someone to say, yeah, I want to diversify as long as I don't have to actually do anything to change myself, as long as the congregation doesn't have to change. And I suspect that's a struggle that a lot of people are going through, end quote. I remember the first time I attended a service at the Assemblies of God Church in Walport, Oregon. I was 15 years old and had been hired as the babysitter to care for the kids in the congregation. And when there were no children, which happened fairly regularly, there were about 40 people in the congregation. And if the pastor's wife stayed home, there were usually no kids. <laughs> And I had grown up really enjoying church far more than my family did. And we sometimes attended a Presbyterian church or a Congregationalist congregation. And so I had a fair amount of experience in mainline Protestant churches, which have services that are fairly similar to ours. Hymns, a 15 or 20 minute sermon, readings, prayers, etc. And so imagine my surprise when I found myself in the middle of a full-on Pentecostal service. 20 minutes of praise music in the beginning, many of which I can still sing at the drop of a hat. I will not do that right now. A 40-minute sermon and a very long prayer altar call that people talked through. Now, it was similar to the black church in that the talk was all amens and oh yes lords, but as a little white Protestant girl in Walport, Oregon, my first thought was, you can't talk while someone is praying, that's rude. <laughs> Neither way was right or wrong. It was just a different culture. Not racially or ethnically, but a different expectation of what church was and what you did and how you behaved during church. COVID forced us to adapt to a different worship culture. We couldn't gather together in person. 
But for some of us, gathering together online totally worked. The entire experience of pandemic has been a master class in adaptation. Some of it has been horrific. Some of it has been really helpful. The disability community had been asking for years to have options available to work from home. And now some companies are seeing that this is a valid option and a helpful choice to offer to lots of workers, especially those who also are caregivers. We will stick with our Zoom options because they make church more accessible for a lot of people who live further away or who have a harder time making it for any reason. And we will meet in person when we can as well because for many people this works better. We are getting to the point where it doesn't have to be an either or. It can be a both and. And we can do the both and of holding on to our beliefs, our core religious values, and making room for others. Mary Byron, a white woman who is part of the Commission on Appraisal, wrote, it may be a simple statement to say that my faith calls me to action. And it is sometimes not so easy to live. As a white person, I have needed to do a lot of deep spiritual work on myself and learning the ideas of supremacy that I have absorbed from our culture is so much harder than learning about injustice. And yet I know we won't move away from our comfort in white supremacy until we unlearn and dismantle it in our lives. Arundhati Roy said, the trouble is that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once you've seen it, keeping quiet, saying nothing, becomes as political an act as speaking out. There's no innocence. Either way, you're accountable. Mary Byron continues, when I moved past claiming my innocence in building these systems and denying their racist intent to see them, really see how they operate, I couldn't unsee their injustice. It's in the news every day, everywhere. Keeping quiet, doing nothing, isn't an option for me in a faith that proclaims that we respect the inherent worth and dignity of all people. There is no dignity in economic, housing, justice, immigration, environmental and education systems that create such unequitable outcomes. White people built these, and white people are required to dismantle these unjust, inequitable, and cruel systems to completely transform them. I knew that I couldn't do this transformational work unless I was willing to get uncomfortable, to start by acknowledging my role in, this, in our systems and the ways I participate in upholding our dominant white culture, ways like conflict avoidance, Assuming that good intentions are enough. Denial, tokenism, white savior behavior. It's hard to see these things in myself, she writes, but I need to see it and change it in order to live the principles I believe. This is a part of my spiritual practice. I practice humility and forgiveness for myself and my community as spiritual work. My friends, I invite us to do some of that work ourselves. It's hard. It's kind of not super fun, to be honest with you. But I think it's really crucially important. Because if we want to be the beloved, diverse, welcoming community we want to be, we have to look at ourselves and do the work. May it be so. Blessed be and amen.